This is part one, the overall explanation of sleep apnea. The more people understand about the entire process or about their disease, the more invested they are in fixing it or getting better or understanding it. And so that's what this entire video is for. Now, first an introduction, my name is Jason. I'm a registered polysomnographic technologist and I've worked for 20 years in the field of sleep medicine. I've literally done just about everything that you can do in the field of sleep medicine. And so I wanna share what I know with you. Now, many of you already know me from my YouTube series, uh, The Lanky Lefty 27, where I do what I call infotainment. I try to make it fun. Look, sleep apnea is extremely boring. I try to bring you information that you need and I try to do it in a fun way. This video is not gonna be that. I'm gonna to try to get right to the point on all of these. We might have a little fun, but not too much. Please keep in mind, a lot of members of my family have sleep apnea, as do I. So I look at this as you guys are my extended family. I want you guys to get better. And if you have questions, go ahead and ask them in the comments section down below. One more point that I need to bring up is this video is sponsored by me. Amazon purchases are at an all time high, so please consider using my Amazon affiliate link down in the description box below. Are you not using the affiliate link? You make Boof McTavish pause on drinking his mocha latte capilata papa? You can use my Amazon affiliate link for anything. Just know that whatever you buy, anything at all, I earn on all qualified purchases. Boof is tired of being boofed up. Wow, that's a great price. Boof McTavish always uses the you affiliate link. link. I will also be mentioning other products and services that I provide during the rest of the video when it's appropriate. And I'll let you know about that. And uh, I'll tell you why I'm better. So there's different forms of apnea. You have obstructive apnea, central apneas, mixed apneas, you have hypopneas, and you have respiratory effort related arousals. Pretty much five things that are all under the category that get lumped under sleep apnea. I'll go over these in a little more detail here in a second. The first thing that we need to discuss though is, is sleep apnea real? And the answer is yes. I'll show you some examples of these later. Typically when people say sleep apnea is not real, what they really mean is they're not real happy with the diagnosis that they have, or they feel like someone at the durable medical equipment place is trying to pull a fast one on them and scam them out of some money, or they feel like their doctors are making money off of them, sending them in for referrals, for sleep studies and testing and equipment that they feel the patient feels they don't need. So let me talk about some of this. In the past, there was that problem. It was like the Wild West when I first started. There were a lot of sleep labs opening up, private ownership where the physician owned it or the physician owned a part of it. And there's a lot of uh, shadiness going on. I certainly admit to that. So since then, there's some laws that have been enacted. There's the anti-kickback law and then there's Stark law. The anti-kickback law is if a physician does not own a lab or they do not own a DME and they make a referral there, sometimes they would get money back or they'd get like a referral fee for that. That is no longer the case. You can't do that. It's, <laughs> it's, if you wanted to do it, it's really tough. Now there's also Stark laws and this is what prevents physician self-referral. So you can't, you can't refer a patient to your own company um, unless you've applied for safe harbor through the Office of the Inspector General, which is a whole thing. You can look up, look into it if you want. Um, but I will be the first to say that yes, there has been corruption in the past, but you can't just say that because you've been diagnosed with sleep apnea, it's automatically a fraud. Sleep apnea is very real. I don't know the particulars of your case, but for the most part, if you have sleep apnea, you have sleep apnea. So let's put that aside and I'm gonna show you the real world examples of it and you can decide for yourself. Now, how do you know if you have sleep apnea? Well, one sign is that you are a snorer. So you'd have witness snoring, you might catch yourself waking up snoring. You'd also notice a daytime sleepiness or some people call it hypersomnolence. The other thing is a bed partner or someone in your home uh, that witnesses you having apnea, you holding your breath while you're sleeping. Some of the long-term effects of sleep apnea are high blood pressure, stroke, heart failure, irregular heartbeats, heart attack, diabetes, depression, uh, and headaches. You also might experience some things like memory loss, concentration problems. So all of these examples that I'm gonna be using right now are gonna be from my website, uh, freecfadvice.com. Um, I, so you can explore these on your own. I just wanted to kind of go over these with you in a little more detail so you know exactly what you're looking at. I'm also going to include some links down below of me actually going in more detail while actually scoring a sleep study. So you can kind of get a little, do a deeper dive if this is something that interests you. Look for that in the description box below. Okay, so what we're looking at here is an obstructive sleep apnea. This is what a sleep study looks like. So we have eyes here. This is the chin. These four here are the EEGs. This is your brain activity. This is a snore sensor. These are electrode attachments on your legs. This is the airflow channel of breathing. Chest and abdomen are belts that go around you. 
and we have heart rate and blood oxygen levels. So you kind of have to take all of this in as a picture. Um, you're going to see that I'm going to use these parameters for every single example here, but um, this is more or less what we're looking for. So if the chest and abdomen belts are moving, that means that you are trying to draw a breath. So you can see this person is trying to draw a breath the entire time. Now what makes an obstructive apnea an obstructive apnea is it has to be decreased in the nasal airflow of at least 90%. Basically these are 100% as a line goes completely flat, but you can see this person is still trying to breathe. You might be saying, so what? Okay, well, what happens with the uh, rest of the breathing? You can kind of track along here. You can see the heart rate. It's going really, really fast. Then it's slowing up. This is after they take some breaths, and then it starts to speed up again as a person is holding your breath. That takes a really big toll on the heart um, all throughout the night when you're supposed to be resting and it should be dropping. Now, other things that we can look at, you can so clear obstructive apnea, heart rate spikes. Now you can look at the blood oxygen level. It goes from 97% and it drops all the way down to looks like 91%. So that's a pretty good desaturation of 6%. Now, another thing that you're going to notice is this is the EEG. So this is the person's brain activity. This is a two minute window. So it's a little harder to see, but you can see the general look of it. Now right here, right as the apnea ends and the person starts to breathe again, you can see the speeding in the EEG. This is them waking up. So they're waking up here, they're waking up here, and they're waking up again here. This is just a two minute window and this person is woken up. It looks like they're about to have another one. So they're waking up like three to four times in a two minute period. I'm gonna shake things up a bit and show you a central sleep apnea. Central sleep apnea is a little bit different in that every other form of apnea is kind of an obstruction. There's something blocking the airway that's causing them to wake up. Uh, in central sleep apnea, there is no blockage. So like I mentioned before, these belts, the breathing belt, and then these are the effort belts of them even trying to breathe. They're not even trying to breathe. Their airway is open, it's perfectly fine. They're just not breathing. So central sleep apnea is treated in a different way, but it's just as effective with different forms of PAP therapy. So some of the interesting things about this is not even trying to breathe. In this particular case, they're not even waking up, but you can see that this has other harmful effects of their heart is still doing the same thing of speeding up, slowing down. But then their blood oxygen level, their, their, you know, their, the organs of your body are being deprived of oxygen. So right here, this person is dropping from you know, roughly 95 to 85. You can see the blood oxygen level really dipping down, really dipping down over and over again. This is a very specific form of central sleep apnea. It's called chain stokes respiration. Uh, you can look that up on your own. Again, I'll link to some central sleep apnea videos that I have. But this is an overall look of a pretty typical central sleep apnea patient. Now I have an example of a hypopnea. Now, some people have actually heard it pronounced at hypopnea, which I guess is actually technically right, um, but it just sounds dumb. So anyway, this is a hypopnea, and more or less it's the exact same as an obstructive apnea. The only difference is there's no complete cessation of breathing. So the exact definition is that the airflow needs to decrease by 30% or greater. So really 30% to 90%. Anything beyond that would be obstructive apnea. So you can see there's a hypopnea right here. Uh, airflow increases up until this high point. The person wakes up. Blood oxygen level goes from 96 down to about 93. And then they start all over again. Blood oxygen level goes from 97 down to 93. So the saturation of 4%. The person wakes up again right here. Again, this is a two minute window. So there's two hypopneas in a two minute window. That's uh, a pretty high AHI. Now there's different rules. I don't want to confuse you with them, but there's different rules that some sleep labs use for determining hypopneas. One is a 3% desaturation and the other one is basically a 4% desaturation. Uh, there's a little more detail to it, but there's a, it's rule 4A versus rule 4B, something to look up if you are having a hard time sleeping and want to bore yourself to death. Here we have a mixed apnea. This looks a little different because I'm just using a one minute window. A mixed apnea is a combination of a central apnea and an obstructive apnea. So the airflow you can see is flat the entire time, just like you'd expect an obstructive apnea. But the bottom part, the chest, they're not trying to breathe here. They're not trying, not trying. And then now they're starting to try. So that's what makes it mixed. You still see the same blood oxygen desaturation. You still see arousals like this. It's a lot more clear because it's a because of the screen size. And then we also have the heart rate speeding up slightly here. Now there's some physicians that actually confuse mixed apnea with they have both obstructive sleep apneas and central sleep apneas. That is not the definition of a mixed apnea. That's actually called complex sleep apnea. This is actually a mixed apnea right here. It's actually a very specific event. It is not a diagnosis. 
And now this is the event that actually causes me the most frustration, actually more or less more patience, the most frustration. This is a respiratory effort related arousal, otherwise known as ARERA. And this is what gets you the diagnosis of upper airway resistance syndrome. So these I like to look at as being the exact same as a hypopnea. The only thing that's different, so you can see the decrease in airflow here, they're still trying to breathe. It, as the name suggests, results in an arousal here where the person wakes up. The only difference is the blood oxygen level does not drop as low. So depending on what definition you're using of hypopnea, the blood oxygen level will, you know, either doesn't drop at all or it drops up to 3% or 2%. The thing that causes the most frustration is that this is only used to calculate the RDI, which I'll get into a little bit more later. But if you're only having RERAs, you're still going to have all the problems of having a greater chance of high blood pressure, stroke, heart failure, diabetes, depression, headaches, and you're gonna be extremely tired throughout the day. The only problem is your insurance is gonna do nothing to pay for treatment. And sometimes doctors uh, won't even wanna treat you for it. So if you find a doctor that actually recognizes RERAs and looks for them, I think you're gonna be better off in the long run. Now, if you have any questions about these events, go ahead and explore some of these on my website, freecfadvice.com. I'll include as many videos on the subject as I can in the description box below. And if you have any questions, specific questions, go ahead and ask them in the comment section below. So with all these examples of sleep apnea, you can see the detrimental effect that it has on your health and your sleep. This is when you're supposed to be sleeping, you're supposed to be resting, you're supposed to be recuperating, healing, and none of this is being allowed to happen and it has really bad effects on your organs and overall quality of life. Please watch my next video, which is gonna be section two and it is gonna be on modes of testing. What are the different ways of being tested for sleep apnea? Thank you to anyone watching this video, but an extra special thank you to my top level Patreon supporters. Thanks buddy to Ken Spackman, Alan Liu, Matthew Gray, Stuart Hethington, and Mona Swearingen. Thank you and thanks buddy.